Hello everyone. A very good morning to all. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all the attendees who have joined us this morning. Thank you for your participation in today's webinar, organized jointly by Bentley and Geospatial World. I'm Kasi Rajan. I work with Geospatial World as the industry manager for the AEC and Digital Cities Vertical. I'll be your host and the moderator for today's webinar titled How Leading Cities Are Achieving Economic, Social, and Environmental Sustainability Goals. Worldwide smart city spending guide forecast smart cities initiatives will contribute to around 124 billion US dollars. With USA set to dominate this market with a regional share of 26%, it's ever so important to understand the innovation, the digital transformation, and the processes involved along the way in this journey. Digital transformation forms the core of these smart city initiatives across multidisciplinary sectors, as well as its cross domain, including resilient energy and infrastructure, data-driven public safety, intelligent traffic, tra traffic and transport management, and advanced transportation infrastructure, to name a few. 4AR and Frontier Technologies in City Planning and Infrastructure Management is projected, is projected to have one of the highest spending among other technological applications. The recent study conducted by ESI Thought Labs in 167 cities titled Smart City Solutions for a Riskier World has identified smart city elements which have contributed to advancement of cities' economy as well as sustainability capabilities. The report is indicative of the pandemic and its tremendous impact in the acceleration of technology adoption. With the advent of digitalization as a means to provide infrastructure intervention for critical sectors, smart city initiatives will host frontier technologies like Digital Twin to undertake large scale challenges. The webinar today, today intends to drive the discussion towards the understanding of the appropriate technological application in key urban domains. We'll kickstart the session with the findings and advanced insights into smart cities infrastructure, evidence-based roadmaps showcasing innovative technological solutions and business models for city infrastructure in post-COVID world. Thereafter, the session focuses on user experiences from highly trained urban planning and development professionals who have worked in public and private organizations in development of large-scale city infrastructure. We'll also get to hear the, the point of view from a technology provider with regards to application of technologies for best practices in citizen engagement. Without further ado, I hereby present the speakers for today. We have Lou Selly, the founder and CEO of ESI Thought Labs, followed by Jeremy Goldberg, Worldwide Public Sector Director of Critical Infrastructure at Microsoft. We also have among us Thomas Coleman, Vice President and Director of Technology Integration and Planning, WSP. And finally, Irma Ali, the Product Engineer for Open Cities Planner from Bentley Systems. I would like to extend my thanks to all the speakers today for your kind participation and for choosing to share your knowledge in the cross-sectoral urban domain. I will begin with the presentation of Lou. His presentation is based, based on the key findings of Smart City Study. Lou, over to you, please, your presentation. Thank you so much. And a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Lou. What I'd like to talk to you all about is our study that we just completed on smart city solutions for a riskier world. And it was, um, it was sponsored by a, a range of organizations, including Bentley and Microsoft, who are on the call today. I'd like to first tell you about the research methodology. It was a very comprehensive study. We, uh, we surveyed uh, 160 cities worldwide last year during uh, the pandemic uh, to find out exactly uh, the impact that the health crisis was having on their cities and what they would do differently as a result in the future. We also uh, created a sustainability progress index, which allowed us to um, categorize cities in uh, three stages of SDG progress. And implementers that were early in their journey, advances that were midway, and sprinters that were jumping ahead. And we also categorized cities into uh, three small maturity stages, beginners, intermediates, and leaders. One of our goals was to correlate uh, the two so we could see how smart technology could drive social and environmental goals. We did secondary uh, analysis of data from all around the world, including some of our partners like the World Bank and the UN. 
Uh, we also developed a multidisciplinary advisory board, which consisted not just of our sponsors, but also city leaders from around the world, um, experts from academia and from the government um, multilateral kind of sector. So it was a, a very comprehensive study to really understand uh, the future of cities post pandemic. Uh, we surveyed everyone from the mayor's office to uh, the director of urban planning to uh, the director of smart city initiatives and the CIO, all people that would have knowledge of smart technology and sustainable goals. So I'd like to just tell you what we found. And I think this quote from Mikel Rodriguez from, um, from Barcelona tells it all. You know, he, what he told us was that the challenges we faced uh, with the pandemic just prioritized their agenda of SDGs. And, uh, and I think he spoke for lots of city leaders when he said that. Now, we asked about the disruptions that occurred over the last year or two. And the pandemic was at the top of the list. And second was economic growth, but often that was linked to the pandemic. So in, in, in the views of many of the executives that we uh, surveyed and talked to, it's very clear that this was one of the biggest upheavals their city has faced. It was a watershed moment actually for cities, and it's gonna to lead to uh, lasting impacts over two thirds said uh, because of the pandemic, they would be reconsidering urban planning and use of space. Over half are rethinking mobility and transportation. Over half are shifting to telehealth. Over half, which is a very important number here, said uh, the pandemic will permanently change how people live, work, socialize, and travel in cities. So that's a powerful statement. And we asked a bit, we delved into exactly how uh, things would change. Now, one of the, the big points that came out is um, that smart city programs are crucial for the future. Another two thirds of, of city leaders said that to us. So COVID-19 really highlighted the value of smart city programs and the importance of smart city programs to drive uh, social, economic, and environmental outcomes. And it's and when we talked with leaders, they said, well, technology optimizes the use of scarce resources and it can scale really quickly to meet changing needs. So, um, so that's important for city leaders to keep in mind. The other key lessons were pay more attention to citizen health, uh, that operational con continuity and agility and resilience are crucial for the future, as is data, okay? And in, in, in investing in upgrading core tech infrastructure for over one third of cities uh, was a big lesson learned. Now, what I found surprising is how much focus cities were already placing on the SDGs, particularly on the SG, SDGs relating to people, which are things like no poverty, good health, quality education, equality. Also planet, although a little bit lower than people uh, because it was put on the back burner uh, a bit uh, as the pandemic um, was uh, disrupting <laughs> cities. So a uh, life on land, clean water came out pretty high. Prosperity, of course, decent work in economic growth and infrastructure and industry, uh, also um, very much top of mind for many cities. And then peace and partnerships, a little bit lower, but still quite important. And partnerships becoming much more important in the future. So as I told you earlier on, we categorized um, cities into whether they were beginners or sprinters. And the sprinters, the ones that were furthest ahead, um, do five things differently than the rest. First of all, they monitor progress. Just about all of them regularly, regularly uh, monitor SDG progress, okay? They gain wide support, 86% uh, 
um, get the support, not just locally, but at all different levels of government. Uh, 78% set up a department to lead the SDG efforts, which is important uh, to, to give them focus. Uh, 72% measure SDG progress against their peers to identify strengths and weaknesses. And then over half conduct a voluntary local review, which is important because that gets um, announced to, to the world about all the good work they're doing. But I, but I can't say that it's all going to be easy because uh, there are major challenges and headwinds that cities face over the next three years. Uh, the biggest, of course, are complex policies and regulations. It's hard right now for cities to move in an agile way, which is necessary. Uh, and, oh, and about half say finding the right partner or supplier uh, to do uh, the next work that's required. And data security and privacy at 44%, a very big challenge uh, for, for cities going forward. It was a challenge during the pandemic where attacks on cities rose, um, doubled over, over the, the period. And many of the cities that were part of the study, even I wouldn't say many, but a number of them have, were attacked um, during the course of uh, the study. And what we also saw was that these challenges varied by uh, where the, the city was located. So for the more advanced markets, regulations and suppliers and, and um, security was a much bigger threat. Whereas for emerging markets, it was more about budget constraints, inadequate physical infrastructure, and just keeping up with the past, fast pace of change. So I'd like to just jump right into uh, one key finding, and that's the rise of Cities 4.0. And uh, what we found is we've been doing this study for many years, and we've been on the journey since Cities 1.0. Things have changed, and what sets Cities 4.0 apart are they are much further ahead in smart city initiatives. So they are, are, are doing a good job of using digital technology to transform and interconnect parts of their cities to do a much better uh, job in meeting the needs of citizens. But in addition to that, they are making great progress on the SDGs. So it's really smart technology meeting sustainable goals. And the vice, um, the vice chairman, uh, the vice mayor uh, of of a, of, a, of one of the uh, Porto, uh, one of the cities that we interviewed, said, "You know, a smart strategy is a sustainable strategy." They really joined at the hip, and we could see that of the 36 SDG sprinters, about 20 of them were also smart city leaders, and you can see who they are in this list. It's Athens, Baltimore, Barcelona, New York, Paris, LA, Copenhagen. It's an interesting list of, of cities. And what we found is there are four steps that these cities took to become what we're calling cities of the future, City 4.0. And uh, the first is uh, they leverage latest technology. They're making sizable investments in foundational technologies like the cloud and IoT, but also specialized solutions such as blockchain and AI. They're also, uh, they also see data as a strategic asset. They draw on a lot of these technologies uh, to bring in more data, and they are bringing in data from all different places, biometric data, geospatial data, real-time data, and so they're able to make better decisions. In fact, one of the biggest problems during the pandemic was cities felt they didn't have enough real-time access to data to make decisions as trends emerged quickly. They also take advantage of the ecosystem. They're very good in working with partners, universities, communities, industry associations. It's not surprising that many of the cities on our list uh, have um, great institutions and uh, universities, for example, in their community, New York and Philly, just two examples. 
and then they engage their citizens. They, it's important that they analyze the needs and expectations of city, citizens, they proactively get their feedback and get their buy-in. And if they do it this way, uh, they can get much higher ROI, which is what we, we were saying, that uh, we measured the ROI of investments across different city domains, from digital infrastructure to mobility, public safety, living in health, environment and energy and water and government education. And you can see cities 4.0, get a higher return. And these returns are still a work in progress because it's early days in some of these initiatives. And so the returns will, will, will keep on, on coming. So um, I guess the final message is that the pandemic will have a lasting impact on cities. They will be driving smart city programs to, to deliver on their social, environmental, and environmental goals. And the solution really is to become um, a 4.0 city that can bring all of these uh, skills together and deliver on that agenda. So I'm going to leave it at that and turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you, Lou. Thank you so much for the insightful presentation. Uh, really uh, interesting elements, starting with the SDG printers to the challenges in terms of data security and privacy, which was on the rise over the last financial year, as well as the interesting concept of evolution of smart cities. And definitely the smart strategy is the sustainable strategy. With that thought, we move on to our next speaker, Mr. Jeremy Goldberg. He's going to be sharing his presentation based on the insights from working in government about the degree of which technology gives residents better lives, thriving business, and government and the governance that provides great service. Uh, Jeremy, over to you. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Lou, for the incredible work and the research that you do through ESI, ESI Labs and another incredible report. Uh, and thank you to the team at Bentley Systems who are a key partner uh, to help tackle so many of the important challenges and issues that cities face globally from climate and city planning, citizen engagement to transportation. It takes a village and in this sense, Microsoft is very proud to have the strongest global network of partners and ISVs globally. I've spent, as you've just noted, uh, a number of years working in government. And I bring this experience to my work and role within critical infrastructure here at Microsoft. And I approach the topic of today's webinar in the context of what matters for people. So solving problems today and building upon those for the future. I believe that to succeed, we need to plan with our past and our present cities in mind. The future of cities within our built environment that lies in the blending of the new technologies with existing infrastructure to tackle tangible pressing issues such as environmental sustainability and of course, economic and social opportunity. And so what I would like to do is begin with a short video. So, so as we think about that situation of what we just observed, the experience that we're talking about there is one that is obviously quite common for people. You arrive to a station, you're trying to find your way around, you're looking for ways with which you can get to the place that you'd like to more frequently, more quickly. Unfortunately, in many cases, a lot of the technology that exists isn't in place. 
Microsoft and SBB Rail in Zurich, we established this proof of concept with HoloLens and Azure Maps to create the inside mapping of this station in Zurich. They integrated this with existing customer applications for the rail, and we launched this functionality formally in the app. So I show this not to focus on the technology, you know, for the sake of that, but for what the technology can do, what the, cannot, what the technology can be an enabler for. So when we think about why, you know, this all matters and why it matters for the future of our work and our place in government and public sector, there are quite a few situations that we know today global governments are facing and an unprecedented need for expansion of digital and virtual offerings due to COVID-19 and the recovery and building back efforts are changing. The pandemic created an immediate demand, raising the technology risk profile, changing long-term expectations for how government interacts with residents. And while there is an, an emerging convergence on a similar set of government technology priorities being written about, being reported on, as we know, by incredible smart government commissions, the next level discussion is really about how might strategic technology planning for government be far more strategic. And I believe nowhere, nowhere is it more evident in terms of the needs than in cities. So this moment today, right, invites a new framing for cities, one that is the old meets new, which I referred to at the, in the introductory remarks. Cities have always been the places where the new technologies and ideas are thriving amidst long established spaces and societies. Cities are the future, right, of our urban spaces, but they are also being built on the past and the present. And success means making sure that the new technologies work with what's already there and enabling people to build what's next. So why does this matter? In 2018, a report that came out from the UN, 55% of the global population you know, lived in cities and projected by 2050, that number will rise to 68%. So many of the most dire problems facing the planet, which are linked to our urban spaces. COVID-19 laid bare many of these problems, including amplifying the devastating health and economic impact of poverty around the world, making them more visible than ever. And without the investment in critical digital infrastructure, millions are going to go unserved. So what does and what will investment look like that will make the impact to confront these challenges? Well, it means physical investments, investments in the physical things, the roads, the highways, the waterways, the buildings, the housing, what we may think of as the traditional building blocks, how the physical and digital seamlessly connect. It's transportation and it's light rail, it's mobility, as we've talked about, moving around from place to place, just as we saw in that video at the start of the presentation. It's light rail and it's telecom, the telecommunications pieces of the internet that connect you and I, they're sometimes from a technical nature, sometimes these things work better than others, but it's the things that connect us, what we're doing today, connecting the world for commerce with our families, with our friends, with our colleagues. And it's the grid, and it's literally the air that we breathe. It's measuring and maintaining air quality, keeping power and operations running. And like the air, it's hard to notice, except when it's not there. And for all of us, we expect it to work. We expect it to be on 100% of the time. And when you don't have it, when it's not there, that's when you realize when you see it, when it's visible. So our challenge as we think about the future of cities and we are proactive in this work is to make this impact visible because like the air, Digital infrastructure is invisible. How do we do that in our cities? How do we build the future cities? We'll thrive in the future by building and upgrading the infrastructure. That's the digital infrastructure pieces that we're talking about. That makes urban spaces work for everyone, employing the right technology and the tools that will help us solve the problems right in front of us, as well as the ones coming down the road and enable future generations to tackle the issues that we have not even thought of yet. And in the same way, our cities are a place where old meets the new. They are a place where the present will meet the future. And that means that we cannot wait 
that we have to be proactive. I look forward to hearing the rest of the remarks from this panel and from my colleagues. I look forward to your questions and discussions later on in the presentation. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you so much for those wonderful insights. I'm really keen on understanding uh, a bit more granular in terms of how the future cities are dependent on blending existing infrastructure and technologies. And lastly, uh, it's very well put in terms of how digital infrastructure is invisible and reflects on the physical infrastructure. Now, Thank without you. any further ado, I would like to call Thomas Coleman. Uh, he's going to be sharing his presentation on the perspective from an urban planner and technology professional on the role of smart city innovation, as well as advancing the SDG goals. Uh, Thomas, over to you. Thank you. What I'd like to talk to you today is really from the perspective of, of my work as a planner with WSP for over 17 years. But that is how we are advancing our tools and our project delivery globally right now. Uh, that includes the incorporation of the of the SDGs, as Lou talked about, as well as the technologies that Bentley is developing that we'll hear from Irma in our next presentation. But with all areas of technology and re research, this has a huge impact on our company globally. And we're achieving this by using the four steps that Lou identified, making data str a strategic asset, uh, leveraging the latest technology, as well as taking advantage of the ecosystem with cloud systems today and new ways and methods to engage our, our citizens. As we're all familiar, uh, we have been paper-based for centuries, for many years. Uh, and in the many ways, the AEC industry uh, has continued to be paper-based and is for the most part still paper-based today. But we are going under a tipping point right now, a transition to model-based delivery. And that, that, that speaks to what uh, uh, our prior speakers spoke of, as well as the other speakers, of how will you take advantage of data and leverage data in our plans and our models and our projects. Uh, we're in a digital transformation. And the, as uh, Jeremy may have shown uh, with the smartphone video, the Autobahn or, or the, the train line, uh, as, as our cities grow and prosper, uh, and as the technology advances, more and more of our data is, gener gener is democratized and generated by us, by users in our smartphones. This is another key aspect of how we leverage in our projects globally, is data from users and data from stakeholders and, and people. Issues for smart city, we're focused on infrastructure planning. We're, we're all aware of these issues. Uh, down some pictures below is how we starting to leverage these technologies and building, and this started with the development of city models with our projects. The next step is really how we integrate data into those models to make them smart models. Uh, but we are essentially taking advantage of the innovative, the, the newest innovative technologies, the need net zero requirements globally, that are requirements of our governments and agencies around the globe, as well as the gains from using sensors and analytics and artificial intelligence, but enabling our infrastructure to be smart. Uh, we began looking at this at WSP with the development of a citywide model in Chicago, actually, about, an, about five years ago and leveraging open source data and information and technologies to make a large virtual model that we could showcase our projects, engage our citizens in, in, in the delivery of those projects. And I have a quick video here to just give you a scan of that. But in developing this model, we use LIDAR data and other publicly available information, uh, building data, as well as context data, LIDAR uh, taken along the river in order to model the bridges and other information from aerial LIDAR and other tools. But by building these models and developing these models for this project, this gives us an understanding to, to look at the whole ecosystem impact of our projects. Traditionally, an engineering project or a design project may only involve 
all its particular segment of a project instead of the context of a bigger city. We began thinking about digital twins for planning actually years ago, but but this has only become operational within the past two years, mainly because the advances of Bentley, Microsoft, and others in the world that allow us to develop digital twins and integrate data into our models. Uh, this takes on the life cycle concept of a project from concept design to the end of a life, where traditionally many of our work may have been focused on one segment of those of that process. We can now work with our clients through the whole life cycle of a project. And using model based delivery helps facilitate that, that discussion. And actually, as is, is, is Jeremy pointed out, we're, you know, in some ways, we're, we're trying to get to the better dashboard view of what, what a city's 4.0 is. And that, that infrastructure is digital. But how do we translate that digital information into a virtual model or a digital twin model to get? That, that visual or 3D, 4D, 5D, 6D view uh, of the information going on. A lot of that takes sorting out of the mess that, or the infrastructure that has been created for, for, for decades uh, because we're in a transition of siloed information into cloud information. We have to find ways to integrate data together to make that transferable across the spectrum of a project or information and obviously Microsoft and Bentley are, are making advances in that area. When we look at BIM and digital twin implementations and the, the, the sustainable development goals, really the, the reason we're doing this is clear, that we need to anticipate future conditions. We need to involve our citizens and our clients and our stakeholders in a plan for how we integrate with future, these future trends into our work and into our projects. And this leads to you developing industry leading invention, innovations and solutions uh, from our partners. And we're doing this right now on, on many projects that I'm specifically for mega programs around the world, but this is looking at the life cycle of it uh, and the benefits of a digital twin. It's no longer can we, we look at planning, design, analysis, and construction and operation as an owner as a single entity or a silo in itself, but we need to look at all aspects of this within a life cycle, creating a common data environment that enables our project teams and stakeholders to look at all aspects of a project. And we're doing this on, on programs in the USA, Australia, the UK, and in the, in the Nordics right now. Using Bentley's digital twin information strategy, we're able to provide a common data environment. This picture is just a, a picture that we're, we're actually creating WST USA's first digital twin solution for the interstate bridge program in Portland, Oregon, with the Washington DOT and the Oregon DOT. But using these tools, we're able to bring all our design data into a viewer and a collaborative environment linked to a common data source that begins to allow our teams to collaborate virtually and then also share that information with stakeholders and provide real design decision making and, and return on investment in our, in our projects. What is enabling that actually is information management and the strategy of information management that is embodied in ISO 19650. This is uh, uh, being championed around the world, mainly from the, the UK, with as many people may be aware, UK has a digital twin, national digital twin initiative, which is built on ISO 19650. But really what we're talking about is information management and people management, creating a government strategy, a quality strategy, uh, modeling strategy and other things that enable us to to develop the workflows virtually within our models quickly and efficiently to take advantage of, of cloud-based tools, uh, essentially. And this is an example, actually, we just want to show it quickly, actually, one of Bentley's tools, Open City Planner, where we're able to start to do this, actually integrate city models as well as project data and information to look at information to look at information such as a, a perspective tunnel design or alignment or other things 
Uh, by using this tool, we can get high resolution information, design information, planning information, all in one place to share with stakeholders and our projects and our clients. But really, if we look more specifically at the trends for planning, or I call it planning here, but it can apply to anything. And, you know, there's many different things going on that are people said hyper automation, multi experience, democratization, human augmentation, transparency, and traceability. These are all things affecting our projects and our cities and communities all in the US there, as well as globally. But being able to then develop the the technology tools and the the things that will enable us to to use these tools to empower us, the cloud systems as well as uh, autonomous aspects of models and transportation, uh, blockchain of how we actually digitally sign our design documents and server security, as well as security of all this data in the cloud are significant issues around all that. We, we have to actively develop an information management strategy as part of our programs. And that is the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you so much. Uh, I believe we have a couple of questions from the audience members as well. We will reserve it for the end of the session. Uh, thank you once again for your knowledge in terms of data being a strategic asset. Uh, the future trends in terms of the autonomous technology as well as blockchain being practical for urban planning and development. Now, without further ado, we would like to welcome Irma Ali. She's going to be talking about the key technology and processes that cities are applying to meet the critical challenges and charting clear path towards cities 4.0 and beyond. Irma, on to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you also to my uh, colleagues that did a great job with their presentations. They actually did a very good uh, basis for what I'm going to talk about, um, which is going to be citizen and stakeholder engagement in digital cities. So let me just share my screen. So yeah, as I mentioned, so I'm going to cover citizen and stakeholder engagement. Um, I'm going to mention why it is so important for cities to engage with, the, with their uh, public, what citizen and stakeholder engagement is, and what are some of the best practices. So to start right away with the challenges that, that the city face in terms of this, uh, in terms of this topic, um, they begin with having a lot of information that is uh, scattered all over the place. It's very complex and all that information needs to somehow be um, communicated with, with the public, but assembled in, in some way that is um, user friendly and understandable and simple for them. Uh, apart from, from uh, gathering all this information, the next step would then be to, to share that information with the public. And one of the challenges here is that uh, cities often face um, not having good method of communicating, um, usually using 2D maps, very often them being in, in PDFs and a lot of complex text, um, as well as them um, having live uh, live events, sessions that is not kind of in, in tune with everything that digital cities are about, especially not now with the global pandemic. So what this leads to as, as an issue is the demographics that are not being fully reached. Um, for, for instance, when it comes to, to younger citizens, they're not really interested in, in reading a lot of complex PDFs, um, so they're not participating participating in any of the engagement. Um, they're not coming to public halls. Um, that's not where they are. They're mostly on, on Facebook or TikTok or whatever the new thing is, but the point here is that they are always digital. Uh, apart from young people, young, uh, a, people, um, there are also minor minorities, um, disabled people or people that just in general struggle with understanding information that that cannot participate um, and all their comments and feedbacks are not collected. So this means that the citizens as a whole are not uh, addressed and their concerns are not addressed. And then as a result, the citizen could feel uh, excluded from the future developments of the city. Um, and then that leads to, of course, them being unhappy with proposals, them having a lot of questions, having uh, misconceptions, um, having even complaints. 
um, because, I mean, in general, there's a lesser chance that citizens will accept a change in their city if they did not help uh, in building those changes. So all this, of course, leads to uh, delayed processes, and we know that delayed processes means time, and time means money. Um, when it comes to money, uh, an interesting thing that I saw in the study that was uh, published was that um, nowadays most cities are taking their financing from government-based borrowings and private sector financing uh, mostly. But sprinter cities, so the cities that are very successful in being smart cities, are turning more into phil phil philanthropic approaches. So they're more mostly um, focusing on crowdfunding from the public. So this becomes a very important uh, thing because now the public and private relationship needs to be reinforced and, and uh, very clear and, and successful in order for cities to continue uh, with their financing goals. So what is citizen and stakeholder engagement? Um, I, I subdivided this into three categories, which is um, sharing, collecting and creating. And the first uh, part basically deals with the first challenge that was mentioned. Uh, all the information that the city has that has to be visualized and uh, conveyed to the public in, an, in a way that's understandable for them. So what cities do is they turn to new technologies that are super easy to use, that are user friendly and um, basically just communicate everything that they want the citizens to understand. Um, so the goal here is to make a very clear presentation of what, how this, their city is changing and how these changes affect themselves. So it's not only about sharing, uh, collecting that information, but also um, putting that information in a place where it can reach a lot of people. So it's not just uh, live uh, events uh, and showrooms. Uh, nowadays, it's more focused on desktop, mobile, uh, tablet, you know, wherever the, the person is where you can reach them, that's probably going to be on their couch. That's where you should uh, try to, to um, to engage with them. And the last point here is virtual reality. That's more uh, for the younger uh, generations that are more, um, need more engagement to be interested in, in exploring a project. So the next stage is collecting the data. Um, so once the everything is shared, the next step would be to get the feedback from, from all the citizens. And the old school way, so to speak, was to do it, as mentioned, in, in town halls, um, live, and this with the pandemic was not an option anymore. So most cities switched to having live events, uh, having these events digitally, virtually online. Um, so another thing that I noticed from the study that I found interesting was that a lot of cities were investing in AI. Uh, most of, of that was uh, going on chat boxes because um, I'm guessing they want to off offload the government uh, employees from all the comments and questions that they receive from uh, from the public. So they are definitely investing more in, in uh, virtual, virtual communication with the citizens. Um, so one of the successful ways of communicating was done by Gothenburg in this project where you can see um, what they did is they first presented all the developments in the city and then uh, also collected feedback from, from uh, the, the citizens, where they not only commented on the development, but in general left uh, comments on whatever they thought that needed changing in the city that wasn't good enough or they wanted to comment that was good enough, uh, etc. So this kind of digital communication then led to some uh, some some studies that um, some results that were very interesting. Um, one of them was that the age groups that were uh, targeted here and uh, gained were uh, age groups from 25 to 45, which is, as most cities will tell you, the the targeted group that they can't reach that easily. So as when they went live and went with a, an easy platform, then this uh, age group was mostly targeted, unlike the 65 plus um, uh, age group. Another thing was, uh, as you can see on the right side, the feedback that they gave was uh, subdivided by hour. And you can see the first part, uh, they mostly, citizens were mostly active some sometime around before work, um, after work, and but mostly the they peaked around uh, midnight, so before sleep. And this is something that going digital enables the city. So when 
when when citizens are open to communicate and to listen and to learn about their city, that's when they can actually even be targeted by digital uh, platforms. The last step here was uh, would be the creating uh, phase. So it's not only about collecting all this data, but what you do with the data uh, is crucial in, in this term. So as you can see, uh, these are some of the extract I took from the PDF as well. How cities engage uh, with citizens. All of these uh, bullet points were mentioned uh, in the presentation. So this are, these are the things that sprinters are um, working on. To, for example, use gamification to increase citizen participation. So this would be the, the VR, uh, enable disadvantaged populations to be involved. So all this is targeted by uh, sprinter cities and, and other smart cities. And, and here on the other side, um, to wrap it up, um, you can see that the cities are not just collecting all this data, but what's important, they're also analyzing the data. They're processing it, they're sharing it, and they're most importantly using that data as a base for uh, all their future, future development um, and, and their future decisions. And this is what makes all the difference because now they become informed decisions. Um, and just as a conclusion to mention here is that um, becoming reaching all these goals so sharing the the information collecting uh, citizen feedback and then using that for future developments that's what makes a, a smart city a successful smart city and that uh, approaches them closer to the um, sustainable development goals by UN I just wanted to end here with a project that Stockholm did that I thought was very interesting and it, it mentioned, does all the things that me I mentioned here. So they published this project, uh, explained uh, everything in the development in a very understandable and easy to use way. Um, and then after that, they asked the citizens to give feedback on, on so wherever these bubbles are, that's where they, uh, ask them to leave comments on what they want to see in these areas, uh, what they don't want to see in these areas, and how the city should develop uh, these places. After that, they actually used all that information into the future development, and the citizens, of course, respected that. So it was a very successful project. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Irma. Thank you for showcasing how technologies, as well as the frontier technologies, can play a pivotal role when it comes to citizen engagement. Uh, wonderful presentation, including all the infographs as well as the videos that were showcased. Uh, I would like to call upon all the speakers to the screen now. We will have a brief Q&A sessions with a couple of questions aimed at Lou as well as Thomas, Jeremy, and Irma all together. So Lou, I would like to begin with you. Uh, how did you discover the connection between smart city investments and achievement of sustainable development goals? Uh, where do you foresee the cities right now standing in this path? Well, um, we've been doing this study uh, for for a number of years. And um, right before the pandemic, we spoke with the UN. And we knew about um, the impact that SDGs were having on, on countries, which were targeted by the UN. Uh, but we didn't exactly know uh, the impact the SDGs were having on cities. So we went into the study and the pandemic hit, which um, was a very uh, interesting time to do this work. And what we found is that the SDGs were very much top of mind for, for, for most of the cities, which was a bit of a surprise to us that it was so far uh, advanced in, in, in cities. And at the same time, we found that the cities where it was most advanced were smart cities. So there was that interconnection. So we were wondering, why is that? And so we, we delved deeper into it and be, became very clear about how valuable smart city programs are to driving the sustainable goals because technology actually doesn't leave the same kind of carbon footprint that other kinds of uh, things might, solutions might bring. So that was um, that showed us that connection, and 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 I think that's a connection that cities are going to be building on in the future, thinking about how to use technology for the common good. 
and to deliver on their sustainable and their social goals. And I think it's right. a wonderful time for it. The only problem is that there's a digital divide that they also have to address because not all citizens feel that the technology is treating them equally. So that's going to be part of what they have to think about. Right. So this is a follow-up question in that regard, Lou. I mean, where do you think where the most predominant surprises were from the research that you undertook and uh, which the city leaders should be aware of uh, in their pursuit of Smart Cities 4.0? Well, look, uh, on the SDGs, that was a big surprise. I did not realize, no one realized how far advanced cities were already thinking about the SDGs. And the pandemic accelerated that interest. And I, I honestly believe we're moving into a new world. The fourth industrial revolution that people talk about will not just be about technology. It will also be about working for the common good. We're seeing a whole new form of capitalism uh, rising right before our eyes. And I think cities and, and businesses are going to be working together more closely for that common good. So that that's a wonderful surprise. A less wonderful right. surprise is that we, as you become more digital, it's important that you close down any vulnerabilities you have in cybersecurity. And our study found that for only 40% of cities that we surveyed said they were well prepared for cybersecurity. And I think it was a harbinger of things to come and what we're seeing today with the colonial right. pipelines and other issues. And so my advice would be, you cannot be smart without being cyber secure. And the smartest cities in our study, by the way, have a much higher level of cyber security. The big problems are the ones that are at the beginners and, the, and, and, and not necessarily small cities either. They could be very big cities and some of them are uh, in both emerging markets and developed markets. So that's a very, that's a rising threat that cities have to deal with. Understood. Uh, Jeremy, this question is for you. I mean, you did touch upon how digital infrastructure plays more of an invisible role for a strong physical infrastructure. On those lines, why do you think urban infrastructure or critical infrastructure investment is so important for uh, a renewed economic prosperity in all these cities? I'll answer that, but I, I'm I'm still pondering the response from Lou's survey that 40% of cities believe they're prepared, right? It was that was that the right. I, I find only 40% feel they're well prepared. Yep. I, I would imagine it's lower even than that, but that's okay. <laughs> um, sadly, um, so no, I, I, related to your to your question, and thank you. So. So globally, in, in the majority of nations, infrastructure has been ignored. And sometimes it's antiquated, it's often inefficient, it's downright dangerous. Uh, and in many places, it's a threat to you know, economic prosperity and growth. So when we look at tunnels and levees and grids and railroads, ports, you know, all of these things are simply not up to the standards of a top tier 21st century economy. We're seeing that conversation happening in the US right now with the uh, infrastructure proposed infrastructure bill. So my point of view is that infrastructure investment and its focus is really analogous to strengthening you know, your body. So wherever that motion starts, it's gonna ripple right, upward and downward to the adjoining links of the chain. And so if your knees and your back are weak or your core is weak, then you're really in trouble. Uh, and so it, these are the things that core infrastructure investment uh, is what links the people, the businesses, the communities, the regions, it's cities. And so what, what I see is, you know, from the standpoint of digital infrastructure and the physical, uh, and, and the way that I'll kind of, kind of map this out is like five ingredients for it. And in each case, use mobility to kind of help us think through what this looks like for the future. So digital infrastructure is the first, followed by sustainability, data, partnerships, and most importantly, the resident impact. Um, digital infrastructure, right? That's the heart of mobility and digital transformation. Um, connected vehicles, common-based cloud platforms, ubiquitous high-speed, low-latency connectivity, all these things are necessary uh, to achieve the mobility goals that cities have. And those are you know, in place in order to realize the promises of better services, improved operational effectiveness, things that come with digital government. Uh, and that infrastructure has to be followed, right, by policies. Uh, sustainability, when people think of the electric vehicles, sustainability is already top of the list, right? The seriousness of climate change 
it's impossible to overstate the importance of uh, minimizing the environmental impacts. And so when we think about routing people to energy efficient travel options, uh, this will get them to their destination quickly and reducing waste. Sustainability does not end though by reducing emissions. It's about moving to clean digital infrastructure. On the data side, which we've talked about a couple of times here throughout the, 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 the discussion, connected vehicles and transit stations are bringing in unprecedented levels of insight into how people move around the place. And this is key for really understanding how to best deploy government services and improve you know, transit operations. However, the most important thing here, right, the un- kind of underpinning of it is, you know, this is important in terms of enabling and keeping public trust. The trust piece here as to what uh, Irma had shared is critical, to the access to the success of the entire effort. The partnerships with the private sector we've talked a bit about already, and most importantly, at the end of the day, the resident impact of all of this, residents prize convenience over almost everything else when it comes to their mobility and transit options. So personal cars have often been the most convenient because they leave when you leave, right? And they go exactly where you want them to go usually, right? Um, yeah. In order to for our transit to work. So those are some of the ingredients, some of the things that I'm thinking about in terms of why the digital and critical infrastructure investments, physical um, and all, are really core to the next kind of five, 10, you know, 20 years as we as we think about these strategic investments. Perfect. Uh, Thomas and Irma, and this question is for both of you. Uh, so Thomas had briefly touched upon the fact that how data is a strategic asset. Uh, so in that regards, uh, w- Thomas, what are the criteria for best description uh, related to the characteristics of a smart city 4.0? Like what are the capabilities that a smart city needs to divulge for it to raise up that ladder of 4.0? Well, I, th- I think part of that is, is a trend that has been occurring over the, uh, over the past five to 10 years, and that's making data openly available and, and, uh, and transparent with the, with the creation of city data hubs and other information sources that allow that really leverage the private sector to look at data, how it can be utilized for commercially as well as publicly in projects and information that that's essentially how, how Uber and Lyft have progressed, you know, with smart mapping tools and other other things. Until we can get on a global common data standard for many things, that is what is enabling us, whether that be transit information or lines or uh, architectural data, design data, geospatial data, all kinds of data. There, there are many efforts going on in the globe to align these, to standardize these, to make it easier to build, to do things with this data and build uh, digital twins, essentially. Right. Is, uh, that, that's what I see is the the most important thing is, is aligning the data. Got it. Irma, would, would you like to add to it? I think Thomas uh, covered most of it. I mean, I can only comment on uh, in an aspect from from citizen engagement. That's also one thing that yeah. I mentioned that was extremely important. But then again, not just aligning the data, but also what you do with the data, which seems to be an issue in, in a lot of cases with cities. They do collect a lot of information, but then how to use it and what do they do next with that? And that's the crucial part they need to attack. All right. Thank you. I believe that brings us to the end of all the sessions. Uh, a lot of critical insights, uh, knowledge in terms of seamless data transfer, as well as maturity of smart cities in terms of citizen engagement, uh, the data privacy and governance issue that we are facing, exposure of critical infrastructure to a lot of dangerous uh, hyper activities on the internet or otherwise. So I hope this conversation continues in the near future. I would like to thank all the attendees who took part today as well as the speakers. Thank you once again. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.